morning. I want you to know that God is for you this morning. He has great things in store for you today. I feel like that God is putting a calling on all of us today to stretch us in ways we've never been stretched before. I don't know what's going to happen in the service today. I don't know what God is going to do, but I know He's going to do something amazing even more than what He's already done. Are you grateful this morning for Him? Wow. Hallelujah. I don't even know if I would get through all of my notes this morning. What I want to do first off is I want to remind you of the call last week to sign up. There's papers up front here to sign up to be here four weeks in a row between Mother's Day and Father's Day. I urge you to do that. It's going to be powerful because it's going to give you a perspective of what life of love is doing and where we are going. It's going to give you perspective of the four pillars that we stand on, love, identity, freedom, and encounter, which spells life. And our lives are so valuable, and God has something for each and every one of us that he wants to pour into you and to me. But there must be something that we do in order for that to happen. We have to get into focus. What I'm gonna do with the kids today, we're not gonna leave the sanctuary, you're gonna stay in the house today. I feel like that God's gonna do something and I feel like you need to be a part of it. So children, you're staying in the house today. If you wanna come up and sit on the floor here, you're able to come and sit on the floor or stay where you're at, it doesn't matter. I'd really like for all of you to come and sit in, in the center of this place this morning. If we could do that, parents, if you could have your kids come up and and just sit on the front row here on the floor. I mean, I've seen that happen several times. So um, you can sit with them. It doesn't matter, whatever. Um, This is going to be, I mean, God is just doing something different today. I felt it all morning. (laughs) Thanks for setting that example. Listen, God is going to move in a way today that you, you don't even understand. I just I, There's just something in the atmosphere changing. There's something happening today. This is going to be a service to remember, not by the words that I speak, but how the Holy Spirit's going to move today. He's already given me some insight of today, but I want to be open and, and 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 centered up with you all so you know where I am, you know all about me and my heart. My heart is for Jesus and Jesus alone. I love my wife and she's a part of me, but my heart for Jesus is even more than for my wife, for my children. And that song, Lord bless you, Lord keep you, May his face shine upon you and your family and your children and their children and their children. What we do today is going to mold the future for our next generation. What we do today will mold the generation to come with our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. I have 12 grandchildren. I love every one of them. I have five sons. I love them. And my heart today is to make sure that I am centered up, that I am in this place of centeredness where the whole circumference comes together because I'm so centered up with Jesus. And there's no darkness around me because I'm right next to him and he is light and we're standing in the light with him. I don't want to be on the outside edges and the dark edges to where things can come into my life and things can kill, steal, and destroy what God has for me. But I want to be in the presence of God always. My heart is to be in the presence of God always. There's a picture I want to put up. What we have to do is we have to come into focus. You might not be able to see what's in this picture, but there are there are there are sharks in this picture. Swimming in water. 
This is one of those pictures that you got to stare at for a while and get your eyes acclimated to it. And then when you stare at it long enough, you get, to, and I've had other people stare at it this morning so they could see the shark. So I wasn't, I'm not the only one that saw the shark, but you might be able to see it and you might not be able to see it. But I want to talk to you about this morning is that we have to get focused with him. I remember there was times, there was two times that the Lord pointed out to me this morning that I was out of center. I was out of focus with him. One time was at the youth center, down just down the road, I was at the youth center, and, and the, we were doing two services, and the Lord said to me, he said, listen, he said, I do not want you to have secular conversation in the, in the middle of the service, in between services. So if you see me, and you're trying to talk to me about something outside of what God is doing today, and I ignore you, have mercy and grace on me because the reason I ignore you is because I am trying to stay centered up with what Jesus has for you and for me. When I get up at five o'clock in the morning, I get up and I'm, con I'm in prayer from that point to the time you all get here in the morning. That is my heart. That is my heart's desire. But I was at the youth center, and in between services, someone come up and started talking to me. And it wasn't necessarily a bad conversation, but the Holy Spirit was there in the morning service, and he was strong. But the second service, after I had that conversation, God was still there, but to me, he was gone. He was still there with everyone else that was operating in the service. He, they felt him, they felt his presence, but I didn't feel him. Because I got out of focus. I couldn't see what he was doing because I got sidetracked with something else I was doing. And it was something he asked me not to do. And in that, I had that conversation. And he didn't show up. And after the service, I said, Lord, what happened? And he told me I got out of center with him. He said, I ask you not to have secular conversations in between the services. And I did. He said, do you want to do this with me or without me? And I said, God, I, I want to do it with you. I want you to be the center of what you're doing here. The center of love, the center of identity, the center of freedom, the center of encounter. Because as we learn to love on the people in this city, they will find their true identity in Jesus, which will bring them freedom to fully encounter everything that God has for them. That's our call. That's our commission this morning in this region. I don't know if this screen had enough pixels on it for anyone to see the shark in the picture, but it's there. I have it on my phone. David saw it. They saw it. So two people saw it. So we're three are gathered together. He's in the midst. We saw the shark swimming on the screen. And we can take that off if you want. But I feel like God has given us a call this morning, and it's a call to repentance. And even though I've already repented for those things, and this thing, next thing I'm getting ready to share with you, I'm being an open book this morning. I'm always an open book. You can ask me anything at any time, and I don't have to answer you just because you ask me, but if the Lord prompts, I will answer you. Just because you call me doesn't mean I have to answer your call. Just because you text me doesn't mean I have to answer your text back. I am my own person. I can choose to answer your text or not. So if you get offended because of that, you probably need to come to the altar and ask the Lord to help you with that. The second thing that I did, which has been weighing on me, and I take full responsibility for what I did during the build out of this sanctuary. I had someone, I wasn't gonna build this out, and I had someone come from, from Indianapolis, and they wrote me a check for $50,000 to start this ministry. A young couple with children I had no idea about the check. Shelly got the check, and she folded it up, put it in her pocket, went in the other church. And I had already that week before that happened, I said, Lord, I know that you said you would pay for this and that you're here. And I believed in that. And I said, but I'm not making one move until you show me that this is you. That very week, that very week, a couple come down and handed Shelly a check. And we've had people hand us checks before, 
and for the ministry, but they handed us a check, and 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 um, it costs a lot. Just so you know, to build this thing out, it costs quite a bit of money, more than what we had to build it out. I had to do some extreme marketplace shopping. Every piece of wire in this building has been reused. Every wall has been reused. All these walls were office walls, and I ripped them apart strategically and pieced them back together to make the sanctuary. There was 18 offices with drop ceiling in this whole building. And I used what God brought in to start building this. And I said, God, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move unless you show me something. And I walk in the church after they had left, and Shelly was in there. She was crying, and I said, what's wrong? And she shook her head. She was crying so hard she couldn't even answer me. And she held that check out to me, and I opened that check up, and I fell straight to my knees. I said, God, you have answered our prayer. I called my pastor, Todd Smith, and I said, Pastor Todd, someone just wrote us a check for $50,000. Now, we've had checks for $10,000 before. We've had checks for 5,000 before, but someone wrote a check, and those are awesome, and I'm grateful for them, but someone wrote a check, and, and I didn't want to live in a poverty mindset of where we were going, and God wanted to teach me not to live in a poverty mindset, and I said, God, you are so amazing, that $50,000 check come in, and I went that week as well and to sign the contract on the building. We'd already scheduled it, and I was nervous to go. I really didn't want to sign the contract, and I was ready to back out of it, but that $50,000 come in, and God said, I'm I want you to move forward with this. That was barely going to cover the iceberg of what we were getting ready to do. This screen alone, if I wouldn't have marketplace, this screen would have been the $50,000 just for this screen. But I got it for fourteen dollars on marketplace. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for marketplace. And I'm being honest with you this morning. Then when I, when, when I got to the, the, the contract signing and, and the, the, the owner of the property... I signed the contract, and I didn't even know this. At the end of the contract, he wrote in $60,000 to help us build this out. For him, it was a tax write-off. For me, it was a blessing. And I said, God, thank you. So $110,000 with that week, I said, Lord, will you open the door? Because if you're not going to open the door, I'm not signing the contract. In that week, $110,000 came in. But this is what I did. Weeks later, we were doing some other projects, and the money was getting low because, listen, it takes money to run the house of God. I'm just telling you that right now. Our bills are our bills in this place because of the old furnaces. Our, I just want to tell you, and I, I'm just, again, being straight up, our light bill alone for this place at times was $2,700 a month. Just this little building, $2,700 a month. And there was times that, that Shelly and I would pull out of our pocket to cover what was going on because we wanted to stay in that place of being debt-free. But what happened was the Lord reminded me of this this morning. I saw that the money was getting low, and I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. So I borrowed $17,000. I was out of God's will. Totally. Totally. I went back into that poverty mindset, thinking that God wasn't going to take care of it. So I took that burden on myself. My wife and I are paying that burden back because we took that on ourselves, that $17,000. And I said that to say this, that when you get out of focus with what God has for you, when you get out of focus... It'll take you places that you don't want to go. If you cannot see Jesus anymore in your walk, or you cannot see what Jesus is trying to do ahead of you, he wants you to get back in that center place. He showed me a stone that he's rolling in front of us, and he said, I'm crushing every obstacle. And I believed that until that moment I got beside him, and I said, Lord, I don't know what's going on, but I need to have this more money to get this stuff paid for. I don't want to stress out financially. There's days that I am stressed out financially. I don't want to because I want the bills to be paid. I want them to be paid through the church, through the people, through my wife and I. I'm not asking you to give a dime to the church. I'm not asking you for one dime. But if the Lord puts it on your heart, 
pour into the house of God. That's between you and him. My call today is a call for repentance. I have, even though I've repented for these things, I still, there's things that weigh on me. You know, there's things that you've done in your life. There's sin that you've committed in your life that still has that weight and it still weighs on you. God wants you to be free from those things today. Any weight that's sitting on your shoulders, anything that's not from heaven, he don't want you to have on your shoulders. He came to pay that price, that ultimate price. Kids, he came to pay that that price for you. Parents, we have to rise up. Grandparents, we have to rise up for what God is doing right now and today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Joel chapter 2, verse 12. And I'm going to break this down a little bit. Not a lot, but I'm going to break it down a little bit. It says, starting with verse 12, it says, Now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. That means all your heart. With fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Have you turned to him with all your heart? Have you been fasting and weeping for the things of God? I know some of you have. I mean, some of you are just digging in and, and, we're, and we're going deep together. It says, so rend your heart and not your garments. Back in the, back in the Bible days, they would rip their clothes open and show a statement God's saying, rip your heart open and let me have every bit of it. Let me see what's inside because I want to change all of it. I want to move you in a way that you've never been moved before. I want to change you in ways you've never been changed before. I want to show you things that you've never seen before. It says, in return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn to relent and leave a blessing behind him. A grain offering, a drink offering for the Lord your God. He wants us to bring that to him. He has a blessing for us. He has a blessing for every one of us. It's, it's beyond more than you can ever imagine. All these things that we live in, these poverty mindsets, these abandonment mindsets, all these brokenness, the fractured souls, the soul man that's broken, fractured because of abuse or because of whatever we went through as a child. God is wanting to restore all those, your soul man, and bring them back together and just reunite those pieces. The little chips that were broken off here and broken off there, he wants to bring them back together to make you a whole person. Because there might be a time that you did get abused as a child or hit or beat. It doesn't matter what those things are. We have to move past those things and move into the glory of God. And if there's a fractured piece there and you see that laying there, say, God, I don't want that. I want that to be part of me. I want to bring that in and make myself whole and be holy because you are holy. I want to walk in the purity, God, that you have for me. And it says, and blow a trumpet into Zion. Blow a trumpet. And it says, consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, the nursing babies, the bridegrooms from his chambers, and the the bride from her dressing room. That means whatever you got going on, it doesn't matter. Nothing of that things is more important than God. None of those things are more important than what God has for you right now. None of it. He's saying if you're, if you're, if you're, Uwe, if you're getting ready to get married and he's got a call for you to come to the, to the prayer room, you probably should leave your bride and she probably should follow you to the prayer room. Just like you guys were here yesterday, kneeling and praying in the sanctuary to bring what God has today. Michael Rodriguez, you were here yesterday praying to bring what God has for today. 
And I believe because of the prayer of the saints, God is doing something. He's moving today in a mighty way. He's changing your hearts. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, the nursing babies, and the bridegroom, and the bride from her room. And let the pastors, the leaders, the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, to shame. That the nations should rule over them. Why should they why should they say among the people, where is their God? What he's saying here is he's saying, do not, God, do not let us get to a place where we're overruled by the world and the things of the world. And where the people in the world are saying, where's your God now? Where's your God now when you're going through this catastrophe, you're going through this thing, and all of a sudden you break down and you walk away from God and they say, where is your God now? People, we're being watched by a world of people. We're being watched by a world in this city. We're being watched by people, again, we don't even know who they are. There's people in this city that know my name and I've never even met them. They're watching. And there's people in the city that know your name and you've never even met them. They're watching to see what you're going to do. And I love this version, the message version of this. I'm going to read through this. It says, but therefore also, this is not, it's not too late. God's personal message, come back to me and really mean it this time. Come fasting and weeping and sorrow and being sorry for your sin. Change your life, not just your clothes. Come back to God, your God. And here's why, because God is merciful. He takes a deep breath and puts up with a lot of your stuff. He's the most patient God, extravagant in love, always ready to cancel the catastrophe that you've caused. You believe that this morning? To cancel all the catastrophe that your sin has brought into your life. He's ready at any moment to cancel that. He knows. Who knows? Maybe he'll do it now, today. If he did it then, he can do it now. If there's a promise from them, we can grab a hold of that promise for now. Some things were meant for that particular season, but we can grab a hold of those promises and say, God, I want to apply that in my life. Whether you meant it for me or not, I want that, and I want to have it in my life. Maybe he'll turn around and show pity. Maybe when all is said and done, there will be a blessing full of robust for your God. So maybe when he shows pity on you, you'll turn to him and you will give him an offering. You will give him a sacrifice, an offering of love, of your finances, of your time, and you'll give it back today. So I'm calling a repentance offering today, not only for your sin, but also for your tithing, for your offerings, a repent offering, a repent offering this morning for your time that you spend or don't spend with God. Today is the day to clear all those things up and have a clean slate and start from scratch. It says, blow the ram's horn to the trumpet of Zion, declares, declare a day of repentance, a holy fast day. We've been passing, passing for the past three days for the water immersion tonight. It's been remarkable. This is what it says. Get everyone there. Get everyone there. Listen, consecrate the congregation. 
make sure the elders come. But bring in the children, even the nursing babies, even the men and women on their honeymoon, interrupt it and get them there. Between the sanctuary, listen, between the sanctuary doors, the entrance of the doors and the altar, get them there. Let the priests, the preachers, God's servants weep tears of repentance and let them intercede. Have mercy, God, on your people. Don't abandon your heritage to contempt. Don't let the pagans take over the rule, for they will snare and ask where is your God. I don't want my children or my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren to say, where is God? Who is this God that you're talking about? But we are in a generation right now where people are the most ignorant of the Word of God. We're in a generation right now where you go on the street, you ask someone about God, they have no idea what you're talking about when you talk about David and Goliath and all the great stories in the Bible. They have no idea. They can't even, they might know the name, but they don't know the story or the line, the, what the story represents. Why? Because we have backed up. The church has backed up and made it about other things other than God. We've centered up in other areas other than centering up on Jesus. When you center up on Jesus again, the host circumference will come into play. It has to. It has to. You cannot be in the center of God's will and anything be out of alignment. Why? Because he's right always. And he knows best in every situation doesn't matter what you're going through. If you're with God and he is with you and he's in all that stuff that's going on around you. So let it go on because he's going to make a way. When I centered up with him, when I said, Lord, I won't speak in between services about secular stuff. When I borrowed the money and I knew in my spirit I wasn't supposed to, but I did anyhow. I'm not kicked out of heaven because of that. I'm not even kicked out of this ministry or lead of this ministry because of that. But he showed me something in it and he taught me something. He's still teaching me something in that moment. I stepped out. This is what happened. From center of his will, I stepped over in the shadows a little bit and the enemy got to say, are you sure there's going to be enough coming in to get to pay for what you need to pay for? Are you sure there's going to be enough coming in? I'm like, I don't know. I'm being honest with you. I don't know. Maybe I, need to, maybe I need to borrow that. Again, I borrowed it as a church. That's where my fault was. But I've taken on my wife and I've taken on full responsibility for, our, for paying the loan back. I'm not asking you to pay the loan back. I am asking you to get centered up with Jesus this morning. He says, be holy for I am holy. Be ye holy for I am holy. Thank you. What I'm asking this morning, to be set apart from everything, to dissect your life this morning, what you put before your eyes, the Word of God says, I will set no evil thing before my eyes. What do you set before your eyes? What do you watch at night? What do you go home and watch in secret? What do you go home? And I'm not claiming to be like an expert at all this because I have watched some stuff that is, you know, it, 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 it's, it's PG, but for some reason it gets the F thrown in there that what, I don't even know how, how they even rate these stuff anymore. You can't even go off PG anymore. It's like you got to go off of G and even in G it's like sexual innuendo for adults so they can be entertained by the shows as well. So what do we do with that? I mean, how do we, how do we compete with that? Probably just shut it off and throw it out the door, crush it, I don't think we have to go that far. I think God, the enemy means it for evil, but God means it for good. 
but what we put in front of our eyes or what we listen to with our ears. I went back and listened to some of the old songs I used to listen to, and man, they're trash. They're trash. Even some of the Christian songs are about me, 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 I, I, I. Some of them are even trash. The, the enemy tried to move into even those songs so people would be making it about them and not even realizing it, not even knowing it. Some of the artists trying to take the light and the glory of what God wanted to bring. Some artists trying to take people into their own throne room and God wants them to get them to his throne room. Where you go, the places that you go, we are to be in the world but not of the world. We are to go places and be in the world, but not of the world. We are not of the world. So we cannot be in a place that's going to conform us to something that we're not. Something that he has not called us to. I love it that the kids are in here this morning. And they can all be peaceful. And I just love it. Sanctify what you buy. What you spend the money on. Sanctify your heart, your thoughts, renewing your thoughts by the things of God, the, the things of God, the Word of God. Use this right here to, to open up those bad thoughts. Anything that you struggle with, the answer to your struggle is right here. The answer to all your struggles and battles are right here. You don't have to go to any man and ask any man, what should I do in this situation? Most of the times when you go to ask someone what to do in a situation, you're going to get their approval. You're really going to get their approval. So do you think I should do this? You already know, no. But you're hoping to find a yes man that says, yeah, that would be okay. Probably you think it would be all right. But we need to start going to the Word of God and getting our answers. And then once we get our answer... We don't have to go to anybody else. Or we go to someone else and we ask them, what do you think about this? And they go, well, you probably should go to the Word of God and ask God what He says about it. I think that's how we should start living our lives. And this whole thing, turning us around, doing what God wants us to do and not what we want to do. And I'm going to stop here because I could go on and on about this. Again, the message today is... Be ye holy, for he is holy. To consecrate yourself. To sanctify yourself wholly unto the Lord. To sanctify everything that you lay your hands to, everything that you set your eyes to, everything that your mind touches, everything that your ear hears. Sanctify it wholly unto him. Watch what he does, because he's taken us to a level that is greater than we've ever, ever, ever been in. This body right here, he's taken us to a place. Yes, the church is the church house, the church building. Jesus lives inside of us. Revival lives inside of us. We carry the very essence of revival, each and every one of us. And as we draw together as a people and congregate, that's what he says, get them inside, inside the sanctuary, because revival is getting ready to happen, and it's going to happen with all of us together. Being in one accord, doing what we're supposed to do, what we're called to do. Each one of us are called to a certain purpose, a different purpose. We're not all going to clean the toilets. And we're not all going to be millionaires. We're not all going to be certain things, but we are all going to be in the center of God's will. And it's going to work great and it's going to work fine. I got the privilege this week, and I'll close with this. I got the privilege this week to speak to the, the pastor of the Asbury University, and I got the privilege to be on a Zoom call with him and Pastor Todd, and he shared how the revival started in, is it Tennessee? Is that where it was? Kentucky. How the revival started in Kentucky. And, the, and, and, and what it was was 19 people lingered after service. Young people lingered after service in the presence of God. And the pastor calls his wife and he said, I felt like I, I failed today. I felt like I didn't do a very good job in the message. 
thousand people had left, he said. Nineteen stayed back. He said, I'm going to stay back with them. I'm going to pray with them. And he stayed back and prayed. An hour and a half went by. Two hours went by. Three hours, four hours. Then 16 days went by. And they stayed in prayer for 16 whole days. People come from all over the world to see what was going on. And really what happened is that's kind of what shut the revival down. The city couldn't handle it. The plumbing in the city couldn't handle it. There was pipes breaking all over the place. And then you have people dishonoring other people, parking in yards they wasn't supposed to be parking in, tearing things up they wasn't supposed to be tearing up. People staying in their classrooms because they were fearful to go out of their classroom, this college, because they didn't know who was out on the lawn. They knew their students, but there's people knocking at the door that wasn't even part of their community. And so they were fearful of that. And then the students were flunking their classes because for 16 days they didn't go to school. So they had it. And, and he said they prepared for the next time because I do believe God's going to move there again. He prepa- they're preparing for the next time the move. The city's preparing. They're all preparing for this move. Martinsville prepared for an eclipse. So we've already got some pre-preparation for this revival that's getting ready to break out. They already know what to do. They already know what to do. They know where to get the bathrooms at, and they know what to do. They know how to do it. They know the strategic places. They know that people are going to come in, and they've made a way for all these people to come in already. Even though, even though this parking lot was supposed to be completely full, and the city was going to be, going to be gridlocked. They forespoke something that's getting ready to happen. They forespoke something, that gridlock that's getting ready to happen. They're not even going to be able to leave if they want to leave. Why? Because God is going to move in such a mighty way. Today he's going to move in that mighty way. But we have to repent. In every area of our life, we have to repent. So we're going to play this music right here. We're going to turn the two light things just down a little low we're going to set the stage, set the environment come children stay here come and repent the trumpet is sounding we must repent
Jesus said, come as you are. I feel like my wife and I want to be an example to come as you are. Be Jesus where you are no matter what's going on. If you're sick. If you're sick in the service, calm down. Get in the water. It doesn't matter. Go home wet. We've gotten caught in the rain before. It's a call to repentance, a full call to repentance this morning. That means to do something outside of the norm of what you would never do before. something for every one of you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 